Hello, David. Thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. Tonight we have a very special guest. I'm so excited. We're going to do this tandem. He's actually right beside me in my room here. So his name is uh, Dr. Narinder Dougal. And I want to tell you a little story how we met. Um, we were at a, at a trade show at a health fair, and it was probably about four years ago now. And he sort of spied me, I guess. He is a medical doctor, and I'm a chiropractor. So it was, you know, it's just an interesting kind of a mix here, as we know. And he spied me, walked past my booth. I had a lot of people there. I think that sort of attracted him, and he was wondering what this crazy woman was doing with all these people around her. And uh, I didn't notice him too much, maybe just a little bit. But on Monday morning, I had a, a, a message on my desk that said, uh, Dr. Dougal called from Paulsbo. He lives about an hour from me. And I didn't know I'm Dr. Dougal. So I called him up, and he called me, and I called him a little phone tag there. And he said, um, Dr. Leslie, I would like to meet with you. And I said, okay, fine, let's meet. And I'm thinking in a week or a month or so. And he says, tomorrow night. I go, oh, tomorrow night, that's interesting. And he says, yeah, I want to meet with you right away. And I said, okay. So we met, and we found out that we have very similar philosophies. And so you'll see tonight how the way we think is amazingly alike. And after we met, I have to tell you that, and I've gotten to know him since then, Oh, I have to say that I didn't see him. And then a month later, I come out of my one of my exam rooms, and there he is sitting right there. And he says, Dr. Leslie, I want to talk to you right now. Is that okay? And I said, okay. So he comes back in my uh, office, and he says, uh, I need you, and you need me, and our patients need both of us. And after I took my jaw off the floor, I said, okay. He said, I want to get my patients off of drugs. And I can't do it because I don't have a plan for them to lose weight. And you have a plan for them to lose weight. Let's work together on our patients and let's get our patients well and let's get them off the drugs. So I have to say he thinks so differently than most healthcare professionals that he's just a treat to listen to. So tonight he is here and he is you know, just pretend you're having a consultation with him because this is exactly what he's like in a consultation. And he is brilliant and fun and up and positive and has a wide open spectrum and philosophy. And this is in all sincerity. He is the most open-minded healthcare professional I've ever met, including myself. And he has taught me to open my mind and, and take in other people's opinions. So tonight he's going to talk to you about osteoporosis, and he's going to tell you things that you've never heard. I promise you, you've never heard. So make sure that you have a paper and a pen because you're going to have questions, and at the end you get to write those to us, and we'll answer them as, as well as we can. So we're going to do a tandem thing here. So here he is, Dr. Narinda Dugo. We're excited to have him, so just stay tuned. And he's given the first part of the presentation, and I give the last part of the presentation. So thanks for coming. I so appreciate it. And make this a pivotal moment in your life. And we all have those moments in our life that they put us in a certain direction. And so we're here to really, it's not for Dr. Dougal or Dr. David or myself to talk to you. It's really an exchange, an, ex an exchange of energy. So we're here to give you information, but you're here to receive the information. So it's a flow back and forth, back and forth. So we're here really to call. We're, you and I and Dr. Dougal are here to call forth the greatness in one another. So hang on, we're going to switch seats, be a little patient, and we'll set him up. There we go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Leslie, for that wonderful invitation. And thank you, David, for the vision and the inspiration for these webinars of healthcare practitioners to contact with the general public in terms of empowering them to better health. This topic today is a very big topic in medicine, but also for your own health. Today we're going to talk about bone health or osteoporosis and show you how you can empower yourself to better health every day. This topic is one of controversy, but also one of great resources for you to become a more empowered patient. I have to first be humbled by the fact that Dr. Van Romer actually is the one who's going to give you the real gems in terms of empowering your life. 
I'm going to show you some of the mistakes we've made in medicine and some of the controversies in medicine and how we can move forward in terms of uh, the bone health. So, so the first issue we're going to look at is the issue of the importance of calcium. Should we be front-loading our diet with extra calcium or should we look at balancing a calcium loss in our diet? I'm going to tell you that calcium balance is more important than calcium front loading, which is a real controversy in medicine today, but the truth is the balance is important, and we'll prove that today. The second issue is that of drugs. We have many drugs for osteoporosis, but in all honesty, the drugs is not the answer. They can help some individuals who have severe bone loss, but the vast majority of people really need the issue of prevention by diet, exercise, and vitamin D. That brings us to our third topic, vitamin D. I'm going to show you today that vitamin D is dramatically low in our diets and in our bodies. As a result, it is the most important deficit in the humanity of mankind worldwide. The issue of how much vitamin D is also controversial, but 10,000 international units a day is the right dose for all of us, and I will show you that today. We will then talk about exercise and how important exercise is to bone health, but not in terms of making bone heavier or bone density, but in terms of the geometrical adaptation of bone to impact and exercise. And finally, the biggest topic that I will center around and keep coming across over and over again for you is the issue of whether bone quality or bone density is more important. I'm going to show you that medicine made a critical mistake in looking at the weight of bone as opposed to the quality of bone in terms of bone health. So let's move forward. Osteoporosis, by definition in medicine, or bone uh, health, is defined as a bone disorder characterized by compromising the strength of the bone, and as a result, you have a more risk of breaking your bones or fractures. That's how we define medicine, how medicine defines osteoporosis. And medicine has thought for years that the weight of the bone was the most important factor in terms of bone health. But I'm going to show you that the bone quality is more important. Bone mass, or the weight of bone, is important but bone quality is equally or more important, and we'll move forward in that direction. This next slide is a pictorial slide of how bone looks and the, with a 3D CT imaging of bone. This is a scan that, can, that, that allows medicine to look at bone in a 3D image. What you can see here in the normal bone is a very thick matrix and tubeculae or cross bridges that allow for bone to be strong and to be vibrant living tissue. Remember, bone is not an a inanimate object. Bone is living tissue and we actually reform our skeleton every seven years. This is living tissue that is breathing and allows us to adapt to the changes and the loads that we apply to the bone. On the side, beside, on the next uh, picture, what you'll see is this osteoporotic or weak bone. Not only is the density or the weight of this bone lower, but you can also see losses in the cross bridges. These cross bridges here lose the quality of the bone and that's how the bone becomes weaker. And this is bad bone or osteoporotic or weak bone and this is healthier bone. How big is osteoporosis in America? These are the numbers, and these numbers are growing dramatically every year as we get older as a population. The first issue is that over 10 million people have osteoporosis, but uh, three times that much, or 34 million people, have osteopenia, which means they have low bone density, but they don't have frank osteoporosis. The number of women in particular who are affected is, uh, is dramatic. 40% of women over the age of 50 will suffer from an osteoporotic related fracture within their lifetime. This is a staggering number and this number has to be decreased and it can only be decreased by prevention. The drug therapy is a bandage to this issue, but a lifestyle change in your diet, your exercise, your vitamin D intake and the balance of your calcium are the keys to osteoporosis prevention. 
The next slide is showing you the prevalence of osteoporosis in the United States. Like I mentioned earlier, there are 8 to 10 million people with osteoporosis, but uh, three times greater amount of individuals with osteopenia, which is bone that is set up for osteoporosis unless you make a change in your life. We're going to focus on some things, but the first topic of calcium balance or imbalance in a diet, Dr. Van Romer will highlight to you in very great detail how you can do this easily and make this real to your life tomorrow. Some other risk factors that we'll, that we'll touch on, but some things we can change and some things we can't change. As you age, your risk of osteoporosis increases. However, issues of low bone mass can be decreased and the quality of bone can be improved if you change your lifestyle. Estrogen loss as a woman gets older can cause some decrease in bone density, but that's not a major factor. And if you're smoking and drink too much alcohol and don't exercise, so smoking, too much, too much alcohol and lifestyle changes are pivotal in maintaining your health and maintaining your bone health in particular. And we'll go through this in a little bit more detail. But the next slide is really a dramatic slide to show you how common osteoporosis related fractures are. Let's look at the numbers in detail. This is the number of individuals with breast cancer. This is the number of individuals with strokes. This is the amount of individuals with heart attacks. All those three things combined do not add up to how many individuals have osteoporotic related fractures in their lifetime. That means that the chance of having a fracture related to weak bones is greater than your chance of having a heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer all combined. A dramatic number. This number has to be decreased, but it will not be decreased by having more drugs. It will be decreased by having the ability to understand that your diet, your exercise, your vitamin D content, your calcium are critical in terms of bone health in an individual, women and men included. This is a picture or a radiograph or an x-ray of an individual who has a vertebral compression fracture. Vertebral or vertebrae is just the backbones of our spine. One in five women will have, over the age of 50, will have at least one fracture of the backbone. This is a pancaking down of the spinal cord bones. When that happens, women become hunched over or become kyphotic, and, and we call that a dowager's hump. What you realize when you see people on the street, or you in particular, you start to lose height and you start to bend forward. And as you can see in this slide, this is an individual who has some wedge fractures or some pancaking of the spinal cord vertebrae, uh, and that's causing this hump formation in an individual. Now you might say, well, who cares if your bones are a little bit pancaking down? Well, what, this, what happens when you have vertebral compression fractures, that increases your risk of having another fracture and a subsequent fracture. So the first fracture will beget the second fracture. So our goal is to decrease all fractures, and in particular, we want to stop an individual's chance of having fractures. There is no effective treatment for vertebral fractures. The key is prevention, and we're going to show you that today. Now, what happens when you have fractures? When you have fractures, what happens then is that you will have an issue of increased morbidity and mortality. What that means is that when you have fractures, your risk of suffering or morbidity increases and your risk of mortality or death increases. And these are significant issues. The rate of developing vertebral compression fractures for a woman is between 30 and 50 percent in her lifetime. That means one-third to one-half of all women will have a pancaking down of the vertebral compression fractures in her lifetime. This is a massive number, bigger than almost any other disease in America in terms of its magnitude and it can be prevented, and we are going to show you that. This prevalence of vertebral compression fractures causes that loss of height and that kyphosis, or the bent over spine that I showed you in the other picture. So, what do we know at the current time? This whole issue of bone loss, or bone density, is important. 
But bone loss is more than just the weight of bone. You're aging, and that has a factor in terms of losing your bone. Menopause, a loss of estrogen, can cause some loss of bone. But there's a number, of, a number of other risk factors that we talked about, including smoking, not exercising, not enough vitamin D. Those issues also are risk factors. That causes a loss in bone mineral density that causes fractures. But I'm going to show you that this bone mineral density was the fatal error in our understanding of osteoporosis. Because it's not just the weight of bone, but it's the quality of bone that matters. Okay, this is a very important slide, and I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain it. This is what we call the pathophysiology of osteoporosis. That's just a big bunch of words that mean what do we understand about how we get poor bone and how is bone formed. I mentioned earlier that the that the skeleton is remodeled every seven years. That means that you make a brand new skeleton head to toe every seven years. And what's happening is this is living tissue. You have bones called, you have cells called osteoblasts that lay down new bone. These are the osteoblasts. And then you have cells that break down bone and these are called osteoclasts. The way, the analogy I use to understand the building of bone is like a road. If many, of you, many of you might see when we're laying down a brand new road, we'll take the old road down so we have a machine that goes in front that chews up the blacktop and chews up the old road. It, it mixes that old blacktop with some new material and it lays down new bone behind, new road behind it. That's exactly how your skeleton is remodeled. So we have to have a balance between osteoblasts, the cells that make bone, and osteoclasts, the cells that break down bone. The issue is how do you keep that balance? The way you keep that balance is keeping your calcium, your exercise, your vitamin D in check. It is not by poisoning the osteoclast, which many of our drugs do, because these two cells cannot live by themselves. They are like a sister and a brother, or a yin or a yang. The osteoclast cannot break down bone unless the osteoblast tells it how to do that and vice versa. So if we poison one cell line, like many of our drugs do in medicine, it will be impossible for the other cells to communicate. They communicate by a form of communication that's cellular called paracrine communication of the cells. This is so vitally important of living tissue. I think sometimes we forget because we think of bone as being hard and solid that it has no uh, life to it. But bone is pure life energy. The osteoclast and osteoblast are the cells that deposit the calcium into the bone matrix and reform bone every day. It is vitally important to keep this in check, and the way you do that is by keeping a number of things in balance. Okay, now we're going to center on the bone density disconnect. This is the big error we made in medicine, and I mean huge. It is so big that most people aren't talking about it. Why? Because osteoporosis is big business in America. The bone density machines and the companies that make those machines make a lot of money. The drug companies make a lot of money, and medicine makes a lot of money. But no one's telling the truth because the truth is going to have to reinvent what we've done. Now, bone architecture is one of our critical errors. Now, this slide I'm going to show you first by words and then by pictures. The picture will make a lot more sense than the words, so bear with me. Now, when we look at bone and trabecular volume or the cross bridges, the number and the thickness of the bone and the connectivity of the bone is vitally important. It's how bone is made. Remember that one picture I showed you of the bone CT scan that showed how all those cross bridges linked. I'm going to show you what that means. Let's look at the next point in this slide. If I decrease your bone mineral density, or the weight of your bone, by 10%, then you have a loss of strength of your bone by 20% only. But if I knock out those bone mineral density by knocking out those cross bridges by just 10%, but I knock out those struts or the architecture of the bone, you lose your bone strength by 70%. Let me show you this in pictures and it will become crystal clear. Okay, let's look at the first picture. This is normal bone. It has normal architecture, normal density, and normal cross bridges. And it can hold a lot of books. 
That means you have strong bones. What happens if I take away some of the density, but I maintain those cross bridges, those cross bridges, which is the architecture or the quality of bone? It's still pretty strong, and it can still hold a lot of books. So even though you've lost bone density, the quality is not lost. Now let's look at the difference. If I keep the same density, but I take out the, take out the cross bridges, the struts, look what happens. It all collapses. It's like a house of cards. The cross bridges are the more important than the weight of the bone. And that is a critical error, error in all of medicine. We thought that how heavy bone was made it strong, but it's actually the architecture of bone. Let me give you another analogy. Let's think of a bridge. Would you, rather, would you think that the bridge is strong because it weighs a lot? Or would you say a bridge is strong because it was built based on its architectural structures and its cross bridges to be a strong bridge? Many of us would argue that a bridge doesn't have to be heavy to be a strong bridge. It has to be structured properly with the cross bridges, the struts, the bolts, etc., to make it a strong bridge. While your bone and your skeleton is no different. Your life energy is based on those cross bridges and those connectivity off the bone skeleton. Now let's move forward. Now let's talk about the bone mineral density disconnect again. Remember, medicine has focused for years on how heavy bone is. But if that was important and that was the only thing going on, then these things don't make any sense at all. Why is it that if you age and your bone mineral density stays the same, you still fracture? Remember, your weight of the bone didn't change at all, but you got older and you st still fractured. That doesn't make any sense. What's happening is that because of your life choices, the choices of not having calcium balance, not having vitamin D, not exercising, not eating right, you've caused an environment that has lost, you've lost the quality of the bone. Even though the density is there, the quality, the structure of the bone has been lost. That's why as you age, and if you don't live a life that is fulfilled, then you will have an increase in fractures. Let's look at the drugs we use now. Many of the drugs we use, and most of the drugs we use actually, work by poisoning the osteoclast. But that makes no sense because the osteoclast, the cells that break down bone, have to talk to the osteoblast, the cells that build bone. So obviously, if you poison one line of cells, the other one is kind of lost. It's lost its life partner, so to speak. What happens with drugs? Drugs can increase bone mineral density by 1 to 7 percent only. That's it, 1 to 7 percent. Yet they can still improve bone, the, the fracture rate or the quality of that bone by other means. So the drugs don't just work by improving bone mineral density, they also work on quality. But remember, that's only part of the puzzle. The bigger puzzle is going to be the issues of how we can maintain a lifelong healthy skeleton. Now, the next bone mineral density disconnect is the issue of fluoride, or I call the fluoride paradox. The most, in the, the chemical or the element that has the greatest potential of increasing the weight of your bone is fluoride. It has, the, it has the greatest potential of all the drugs we have in medicine. And yet, it can increase the bone density by 15%. Remember, prescription drugs increase it by 1% to 7%. Fluoride increases it by 15%. And what happens? Your bones break. They're more brittle. Because even though fluoride made heavier skeleton, made a heavier bone, it was not good quality bone, and it collapsed. Again, this issue of how heavy bone is doesn't matter. It's the quality of bone. This is what I call the fluoride paradox. Now, I mentioned age. I want to show you this in a graphical manner. So sometimes a picture is worth more than a thousand words. Remember how I indicated that as you age, your risk of fracture increases. This is your bone, this is your back fractures, this is your hip fractures, and these are your wrist fractures. So as you get older, your chance of fracturing increases even though your bone density stayed the same. That means that the quality of your bone was not maintained. And how do you do that? We will show you that as we move forward. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about the bone density disconnect when it comes to exercise. I'm going to allude to it now, and I'm going to go into greater detail as we move forward. We know that as if you're an athlete, your bone density is, is heavier than if you're not an athlete. But it doesn't matter it doesn't matter only the exercise, but also on the impact of the exercise. Exercise intervention will increase bone density by only 1 to 5 percent. But that's because exercise not only enables your bone skeleton to be stronger or heavier, but every time you pound on your bones or impact by skipping, by running, by weight bearing exercise, by just standing, that weight transition into the skeleton allows the skeleton to signal to make the cross bridges. Let me try to explain that one more time. Exercise changes the geometrical adaptation and the mechanical strength of the bone. It literally makes the cross bridges. There'd be no reason to, for the bones to have a network and a cross bridge unless there was impact and there was weight on bone. I'll come back to this in terms of the next couple of slides, but it's so important to remember that exercise is so vital to the geometrical adaptation of bone when it comes to the issue of bone health. And Dr. Van Romer will stress this again for you, but Medicine Now knows, and this is published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral in 1999, that exercise literally tells the body how to architecturally make our skeleton. So it's so vitally important and it doesn't increase the weight of bone very much, only by one to five percent. This again is another disconnect in medicine. Now what do we know about the current guidelines and this is the National Osteoporosis Foundation guidelines in terms of clinical practice. What the guidelines say at the current time, so this is kind of like the dogma of medicine, this is the current evidence-based body of, of data that tells doctors what to do. It first says that all women who are postmenopausal with fractures with a BMD that is low, they need to have their bone density measured to look at the severity. So now the, the established guidelines are telling you to weigh your bone. Remember that's one risk factor, the bone mineral density. And everything, all our drugs and everything is focused on the weight of bone. Not the quality of bone, but how much does your skeleton weigh. They recommend a bone mineral density or a scan of your skeleton for all women less than the age of 65, but to have one other risk factor other than a postmenopausal state. What I mean by that is that they're saying that if you smoke, if you have a history of uh, excessive alcohol, if you're not exercising, that you need to have a bone mineral density test. Again, they're putting everything on the weight of your skeleton. Then what they're saying is that anyone over the age of 65, regardless of your risk factors, should get a bone density scan. This is painless. It costs a few hundred dollars. So it's not that big of a deal. But the problem is that as soon as they do that test, they label you and then they say you need to be on drugs. And that's the critical uh, problem. Then the Aust National Osteoporosis Foundation guidelines will tell the doctors that if the T-score, and I'll come back to T-scores in a little bit more detail, but if your number is negative 2, then you need treatment, and if a patient has no risk factors or has risk factors, then a number of negative 1.5 and you should be treated. But then here again, they become there's a disconnect in terms of the guidelines. What the guidelines are saying is that when you reach the age of 70, you don't even need to have a bone densitometry test done. They want to treat you, and they want to treat you with drugs. However, what they should be asking you and telling us is what can we do for calcium balance? What can we do about vitamin D? What can we do about exercise? And how can we have a healthier skeleton throughout our life, even as we get older? Okay. These are all the risk factors. Let me just highlight some of the major risk factors in terms of fractures. And sometimes you will need drugs. So there is a time and a place for medicine, but there's a time and a place for lifestyle. And lifestyle will always be foundational. Nutritional health 
and biological well-being is always going to be foundation irrespective if you need drug therapy. Now let's look at some of the risk factors. Personal history of fractures. So if you have a family member who's had multiple fractures or has the humped over and lost a lot of height during their lifetime, you have a higher risk of osteoporosis. So you should keep that in mind. If you have a first degree relative, a mom or a sister or an, or, or an aunt, then you're at a higher risk. If you've never gained a lot of weight in your life and you, and you are, quote, too skinny, which is almost non-existent in the American population, then you'll be at risk. If you smoke, this causes a toxic effect to the, to the cells that make the skeleton. They have a toxic effect of smoke to the osteoclast and osteoblast. You should never smoke. Smoking is stupid. You have to stop smoking. And then this is a big factor, this last one. A major risk factor is something doctors do. But sometimes you need these medications. If I or another doctor put you on steroids, like prednisone or drugs like that, and these people are usually ones who have autoimmune diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, then you may need drugs that will accelerate your bone loss. That person will have to be on drugs to protect their bone because I am giving you a drug that actually is causing a loss of your bone and I have to protect you. In this case, you may need drug therapy in addition to your lifestyle changes. Now, how about these other risk factors? Impaired vision and dementia are all issues of increasing your risk of fall and recent falls. Let me highlight all of these in terms of one big factor. If you don't fall, you don't fracture. Let me say that again. If you don't fall, you don't fracture. What that means is that you have to have the geometrical balance not to fall. If you do that, your chance of having a hip fracture or other fractures decreases dramatically. And I'll show you that there's some things that we can take for pennies a day that will improve your balance and your gait so you don't fall. And in particular, just being walking and just taking vitamin D and living an active life will prevent you the risk of falling and fracturing. Low calcium intake is, not the, is, a, is, a, is a misnomer. It's not about how much calcium you take, it's how you balance your calcium loss. And Dr. Van Romer is an expert in this area, and she will highlight how you can empower yourself to improve your calcium balance. I've already talked about physical activity, and I'll show you that in detail again. And then finally, alcohol. More than two drinks a day, again, will cause a poisoning to the cell lines that make bone. So many of these things are reversible if you have the power to believe that you have the, the health is under your control and the only person that can make you healthy and the only person that can prevent fractures is you. So this is how medicine looks at the model of osteoporosis and the clinical workup or the diagnosis. We take a history, look at your risk factors. The risk factors were on the other slide, smoking, not, not exercising, alcohol intake, calcium imbalance, etc. We then will look at your physical exam. The most important thing that we're going to do is we're going to measure you, your height. If your height is decreasing, the chance of you having a fracture or a pancaking fracture increases. We'll do some lab tests, and then we'll do the density of the bone, and we'll give you a label. Then what happens? Based on your bone density or how much your bone weighs, we will give you a number. If it's greater than negative 1, you're, quote, normal. If it's between negative 1 and negative 2.5, your bone mass is decreased, but it's not osteoporotic. If it's more than negative 2.5, you have osteoporosis. That's how we label you in medicine. Now, this label is important to some extent in terms of risk factors, but it's not the only thing. I hope I proved to you in the last number of slides that the issue of bone mineral density disconnect exists because medicine forgot that the most important thing about your skeleton is the architecture, the cross bridges. How do you maintain those and how do you align, allow the living tissue of bone, the osteoclast and the osteoblast to work? That is critical. That is vital. And I'm going to show you how you do that. So let's assess an individual for the risk of osteoporosis. This is what's happening. I call this the bone density conspiracy. 
or you could call it the calcium conspiracy. And let me sort of build up to this for you. This is what's happened. What a bone density score means, so what a T-score means is that your bone density is compared to a 30-year-old woman. A 30-year-old woman, and if you are two standard deviations or negative 2.5, so negative 2.5 standard deviations away from that woman, a 30-year-old young woman, you have a disease. That's like saying that if my muscle isn't as big as a 30-year-old uh, man, then I have a disease. That's nonsense. It's a statistical analysis that's occurred that's become big business in, in medicine. Once we say that your bone density doesn't compare to a 30-year-old woman, we then say your osteoporosis. We then label you, and after that diagnosis, you need treatment, and the conventional treatment is drugs. Why? Big pharma, big money. Remember, this is my life. I am the big guy. I'm the guy who gives you these big drugs. But that's not the right answer. Believe me, this, co this conspiracy is huge in medicine. It's huge because we created an animal and no one wants to step up and protect the American people. But what's happened is it's critically important and we have to start to understand and empower ourselves. There's lots of misinformation here. When Dr. Van Loma talks about calcium balance, we'll show you that big pharma, the dairy boards and the cheese boards, huge lobby groups that pay lots of money to politics are telling us that we need lots of calcium and that's not the case. Critically important medicine has been hooped in a way by the, by the drugs and the bone density scan number. They think this is the most important factor in terms of osteoporosis prevention and risk factors, and that's not the case. The weight of the bone is one factor, but the weight of the bone is not as critical. It's not as cr critical as the quality of the bone in terms of how bone is made and the architectural structure of bone. So let me show you this in pictures so it doesn't get confusing. What the osteoporosis numbers mean, the T-score means that here's a 30-year-old woman at line zero, and that's an average 30-year-old woman's bone density. And if you fall two standard deviations below her bone density, you have a disease, you have osteoporosis, you're sick, and you need drugs. And that's foolish. You're not sick and you don't need drugs. What you do need is you need to know you have that risk factor. And then based on your lifestyle choices at age 20, 30, 40, 50, that is the risk factors for osteoporosis. So osteoporosis didn't start when you hit the postmenopausal age. It started from day zero when you were born, but you can reverse that every day by making the right choices tomorrow. And I'm going to show you that. So let's look at how we treat osteoporosis in terms of the current drugs. So I'm going to first show you how the dogma of medicine says we should treat osteoporosis. And some of the stuff they say is ludicrous, but let's, let's look at that. Sometimes we need it, remember, but the vast majority of the time we can make other changes in our lives. These are all the drugs that we use. This is a very complicated slide. I'm not going to uh, focus on the details. I'm going to focus on what we do. In terms of prevention, they say exercise, calcium, and vitamin D. The calcium recommendation is wrong in medicine. The vitamin D recommendation is wrong in medicine. And even the exercise recommendation isn't as impactful as it should be because it should be saying impact exercise, but I'll come back to that later. But now let's look at the drugs. The first category of drugs for prevention and treatment are called bisphosphonates. These are multi-billion dollar drugs in America. The names that you know are Actinel, Fosamax, Beniva, and other drugs like that. These drugs work by poisoning the osteoclast. They kill the drugs, the, the, the cells that destroy bone or break down bone. But what they don't tell you is those cells are the same cells that tell the other cells, the osteoblasts, how to make bone. It makes no sense. These drugs, although they can improve situations when we have added stresses like steroids or smoking or alcohol or family history, we may need these big drugs or you've had multiple fractures. The vast majority of times, you don't need these big drugs. Furthermore, the data shows that after five years, you can stop these drugs because they get impregnate, impregnated into the matrix of bone and they have a half-life of 10 years or greater. 
That means once you have these drugs on board, they get mixed into the skeleton and they don't leave your body. The most dangerous thing that's happened in medicine is that now we have these drugs that you can get one time a year. They inject you with one chemical for one year of this bisphosphonate-like drug. This is big money because every time you come into my office and I inject you with a year-long supply of bisphosphonate drug, I'm assuming that I know more about the human body than God knows. I'm keeping a drug in your body for a whole year and it's going to be intermingled into your matrix for 10 years. It makes no sense. And we have to be humble to that issue. The other issue is estrogen. We know that in a woman before the age of menopause, estrogen is vital. And so if you have a hysterectomy before the age of 50, then you may need estrogen therapy. But after the age of 55, the question is debatable and there's controversy in that area of medicine. These other drugs we use, called SERMs, or Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators, have some utility. They also prevent breast cancer to some extent, but again, it's for the high-risk patient. And finally, we have a drug that actually works on the osteoblast, which tells the, the body to make more bone, and that's a drug called Forteo. But these drugs are extremely expensive, costing $600 a month to the healthcare system. $600 a month. You could get the best gym membership. You could get a personal trainer. You get a personal chef for that kind of money. But they would never do a clinical trial with you get, who gets a personal chef and a personal trainer versus a drug because a drug would lose. That's the problem in medicine. We have given so much strength to Big Pharma and these drugs, which are valuable in certain index cases that we have forgotten how important the other things that we can do that cost pennies a day can help us in terms of our bone health and empower us to have freedom in terms of our health. So this slide basically just rehashes what I just told you about the bone density. This number has become so pivotal in terms of the matrix of osteoporosis that we thought everything was based on the weight of bone or your T-score. So how does medicine do it? Remember, if you're above, if your bone density is negative 1.5 or higher, you're considered normal. Negative 1.5 and 2, you're at moderate risk and you may be treated. If it's greater than negative 2, they're going to treat you with drug therapy. And although this may be important in individual patients with risk factors, the vast majority of us if we just take the T-score by itself, is not the end-all, be-all. And that's what we have to focus on. So let's focus on this issue. Let's talk about bone balance. And this is all the meat is coming right now. So hold on to your hats because next up there's going to be Dr. Van Romer. But let me go to my portion of bone balance and the bone conspiracy that exists in medicine. It is clear that the acquisition of bone and the architecture of bone is a lifelong phenomenon. Remember, you recreate your skeleton every seven years. It is living, breathing tissue. It is not just a static bone. It is living, breathing tissue. And that includes nutrient factors, physical activity, your hormones are important in your formative years, and all three of this is all three of these are important in terms of a healthy, healthy skeleton. And we're going to try to empower you to realize that this is a fundamental issue of bone balance in your health today and osteoporosis. This is my baby, Sage and Sedona. They're bigger now. These are my children. This is where osteoporosis starts. And that's what we've lost. We have been so concentrated on postmenopausal osteoporosis or women after the age of menopause getting fractures, that we have forgot to tell you that osteoporosis starts from day one. Every day of our lives, the decisions that we make, the food that we eat, how we exercise, the vitamin D, our activity, that is critical to the architectural framework of bone. And remember, bone is going to change every seven years based on the impacts that you place on it. Hence, if you don't put any impact, 
Bowman has no signal to make the cross bridges, and as a result, it deteriorates very, very rapidly. And I will show you that data. So, let's look at this issue of the natural history of bone. You have a steady increase in bone density or the weight of bone from childhood until your third or fourth de decade of life. Then your whole mass of bone has been made. Remember, bone mass density or the weight of bone may have been made by the age of 30, but the cross bridges are made for a lifetime, a lifetime of architectural and geometric re-engineering of that skeleton so that it adapts to the loads that you place on it as an individual throughout your life and the nutrition that you give to it. It's the lifetime risk of remodeling balance versus remodeling imbalance that occurs in an individual. That is a critical formula. So let's talk a little bit about calcium, and Dr. Van Roma will uh, allude to this further. But this concept of front-loading calcium at 1,500 milligrams a day is complete nonsense. We are the only country in the world that recommends this. And why? Because the dairy boards and the cheese boards, they have the, some of the largest lobby groups in the world. And the ad cap campaign, Got Milk, is one of the most effective campaigns ever in the history of advertising. The Got Milk campaign has almost become a dogma in medicine, which is a critical error. It is not about how much calcium we take, but how we balance calcium in our lives, and Dr. Van Romer will teach you this. But if you are going to take a calcium supplement, you don't need to take 1,500 milligrams. What you need to take is between 10, uh, 200 and 400 milligrams a day. And when you take big doses, you can't even absorb it. So you can absorb 1,000 milligrams of calcium or 1,500 milligrams of calcium. The most you can ever absorb at any one time is 500 milligrams. The best time to take it is in the evening. And the maximum you should take is probably 500 milligrams a day. And you can easily get that in your diet without taking a supplement. So individuals who are front-loading with calcium based on this current dogma of nutrition is completely foolish. This has been borne out in the medical literature over and over again. Dr. T. Colin Campbell in the China study, Dr. Neil Bernard, and many others have alluded to the aspect of this calcium front loading, which is basically a matrix of the issues of the dairy board, the cheese board, and that lobby group trying to have their vested interest. Instead of saying that you can get the absorbable calcium that you need from the fruits and the vegetables that you eat every single day without an extra supplement. This is a critical area that we made in medicine. And Dr. Van Roman will teach you how to eat to get that calcium content. Now, how about vitamin D? This is an area that is a personal interest of mine because my clinic is one of the foremost authorities in vitamin D, and we make the highest dose vitamin D in the U.S. The controversy exists in how much vitamin D. Vitamin D is not a vitamin, first and foremost. It is a steroid. It is made by the human body, provided you have sun exposure. The problem is that we no longer get the sun exposure of our ancestors. We are no longer hunters and gatherers. We will never be hunters and gatherers, and the reason being is because we live in a developed world. The sun energy that is created from the vitamin D that's produced by the liver is activated, and then is reactivated in the liver and, and, and in over 2,000 cells. Vitamin D has been shown to improve muscle strength, gait, balance, chronic fatigue, seasonal affective disorder, diabetes, hypertension, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and over 17 cancers. It is the most common deficiency worldwide. It is a deficiency that costs pennies a day to, to correct. And 10,000 units a day will help you with respect to your aspects of how much vitamin D will be necessary. You see, when you're out in the sun in the, for 10 to 20 minutes, if you're fair-skinned, and up to an hour if you're dark-skinned, you make between 20 and 40,000 units of vitamin D. The problem is we don't get outside. The average American gets five minutes of sun exposure a day, five minutes. And I live in the Pacific Northwest, and as a result, I get no sun for almost eight months of the year. I'm at an added disadvantage is that I have a colored skin, and as a result, my skin can absorb vitamin D as effectively as a fair-skinned individual. These issues are so paramount in terms of the global modernization of man that vitamin D deficiency is the number one deficiency worldwide. We do not have enough supplementation in our food. It never came from food. It came from the ability for the human species to be outdoors. 
We are not outdoors. We are modern day cave dwellers. And as a result of that, vitamin D replenishment needs to be done and is critically important and costs pennies a day. I'll come back to that. But look what happens when you take a right amount of, of vitamin D. You absorb calcium by greater than 90%. That means that all the calcium that you're going to take, you're going to absorb, provided you get enough vitamin D. It's amazing. You need more vitamin D in the winter months. And this, this is the most startling data. Vitamin D has been shown to improve the muscles and the tendons of skeleton. So when, when you take enough vitamin D and calcium, it protects you from falling. It protects you from falling. Remember what I said. If you don't fall, you don't fracture. So vitamin D will correct your balance, your stability. It will correct the way that you cannot fall. And it's critical. And we've done this in clinical trials. The evidence of vitamin D is so strong in terms of population-based data and epidemiological-based data worldwide. That means based on studies of populations. You see, no one's going to do the big studies because vitamin D costs pennies a day. But it is so critical to the health of the human being and the human species. We are all creatures of the sun. We are all children of the sun, but we do not no longer get the sun. We used to live by the sun and the moon. We don't live by the sun and the moon anymore. And to think for a second that we need to have more vitamin D is definitely clear based on the world literature. It is as strong. The benefits of vitamin D are as strong in terms of the evidence, in terms of the population-based data, as the detriments of smoking is to lung cancer. Let me rephrase that. If we all believe, and I think everyone in this, in this audience would, would agree, that smoking increases the risk of lung cancer. Well, the data in terms of the world literature shows that vitamin D imparts health benefits as great as that in terms of uh, cost benefit ratio in the affirmative. So vitamin D has such huge benefit to your balance, your gait, your muscle strength, your energy levels, your seasonal affective disorder, your issues of Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, neuropathy, pain, and cancers. The cancer data is so strong that some people believe, and many oncologists, which are cancer medicines, believe that 70% of all cancers could be decreased or slow the progression if vitamin D levels are back to normal. That's how powerful vitamin D is. And at the end of this, of this presentation, I'll show you where you can get the vitamin D. But this is critical to our understanding of bone health, and this is the real crux of the matter. Medicine established a diagnosis of a disease of osteoporosis in the face of deficiency. 85% of, of individuals in the clinical trials were deficient in vitamin D because in the times when we did those clinical trials, we recommended 400 international units of vitamin D, which is grossly underestimating the need. Then we made up a disease. We made up a disease in the face of a deficiency. That is a critical error in science. You cannot call someone a diseased patient when you haven't corrected the basic deficiency. That is an error that medicine does not want to have ownership to. Why we created this entire animal of bone density and drugs and something at pennies a day can correct. We don't want to look at that. No one's talking. As a consumer of healthcare, as an American, you should look at this with grave concern. Vitamin D costs pennies a day. If the whole issue of our skeletal matrix and bone density was about not having enough vitamin D, then why do we make up the disease of osteoporosis? No one's answering that. We have to rebuild the entire database, and if it's still osteoporotic when your vitamin D replete, then we can look at that. But until that time, we have to look at all the literature from this point backwards with, with skepticism and with a cunning eye. Let's talk about exercise. And this is a fantastic next couple of slides. When you see this data, it'll impart to you how important exercise is, but not only exercise, but the type of exercise that you do. This is Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law says that bone accommodates, accommodates to the load that it has on it. What that means is that your skeleton is living tissue. It is going to adjust and it is going to make cross bridges as you exercise. 
that means that the impact of your exercise will wake up the skeleton and say, make more cross bridges. It may not make the bone fatter or weigh more, but it will tell it to restructure it, make a different strut, a different cross bridge to make the, the, the bone stronger. So the habitual loading or lifetime exercise and weight bearing exercises will allow you to have a skeleton that may not be more heavier in terms of weight, but it will be good, strong skeleton. Let's look at that in a more uh, scientific manner. The number one risk factor, the number one risk factor for accelerated bone loss is not steroids, it's not your age, it's nothing except not using your skeleton. Not standing causes a decrease in your bone density by 40% in one year. If you did not stand for one year, you will lose your skeletal mass by 40%. It's akin to basically having no strength at all in your bones. You see, your skeleton can't wake up unless you pound it. You have to wake it up. That's by walking, simple walking, every single day, and standing, just standing alone, 30 minutes a day, prevents bone loss. Just standing. That's the problem. We're all couch potatoes now. So you're sitting on a couch, you're not moving, you're not putting any weight on your skeleton, you're not going to tell the skeleton what to do. It doesn't know what to do, so it starts to lose the bone mass. There's no signal. It needs the lifetime signal of your skeleton in order to allow the uh, osteoblast and osteoclasts to talk and make the cross bridges. This number, 40%, is dramatic. This is the highest degree of bone loss in all of medicine, and all because you didn't move. You didn't move. It costs you nothing to move. And how much do we tell you about that when it comes to osteoporosis? We tell you all about our drugs, all about how fancy we are about weighing your bone, but we didn't tell you how important it was just to move a little bit every single day. Now let's look back at this slide about, and we're coming back to that slide I showed you earlier, bone mass in athletes. When you exercise, you increase your bone density by 1 to 5%. So once you got your complement of bone density after the age of 30, that's your mass of bone. But that doesn't mean that you, you've lost any kind of gain that you can make. All that means is that your bone will recreate itself and restructure itself and readapt every seven years to a brand new skeleton. And it does that daily. It daily changes based on the loads that you put on it. Based on Wolf's Law, Wolf's Law said that bone accommodates to the load that you put on it. That means that you got to get off the couch and you have to start to move. That is critical. That is a critical aspect. Because what happens is that the geometrical adaptation of bone to the mechanical stresses allows for quality bone to be made. Once again, that is quality bone. Go back to that picture about that book, that bookcase and that bookshelf with the books. Remember, when I took out the struts, just a 10% loss in those struts, you had a 70% loss in bone strength, 70%. That's because no one told us the cells, the osteoclast and the osteoblast, how to build your skeleton. It doesn't know what to do unless you put the loads on it to tell it what to do. This is a critical issue in medicine and it has not been stressed enough to the public. As you as ambassadors of health for your community, for your family, once you get this information, make it personal, Start to walk more, understand it more, and then make it real for yourself and your family members. Now let's go back to the old definition and the new definition. The old definition of bone concentrated everything on bone mass, or bone density. The new definition of bone by medicine says it's a skeleton disorder carried by compromised bone strength that, in, that predisposes you to fractures. Compromised bone strength, not just by bone density. So the new definition that came out in 2000 took away this bone mass. Was this told to medicine? Was this told to you as a consumer? No. But this is the critical aspect that we have to start to uh, entertain in medicine. I'm now going to take a little bit of time to introduce Dr. Leslie Van Romer. I can't stress to you how important her slides are going to be to you. 
I've given you a lot of information on the definition of osteoporosis, the aspect of what we fail to recognize in medicine in terms of how important the quality of bone was. We put everything, we put every, we held everything in osteoporosis on the weight of bone. But that wasn't the, the answer. That was only part of the puzzle. The quality of bone was important. I also stress today the issues of exercise and how your bone skeleton will always remake itself based on the loads that you put on it every single day. And then critically, I showed you that vitamin D at 10,000 international units a day is the right dose. Don't let anyone tell you differently. And then the aspect of calcium. Front-loading calcium with supplements is not necessary. You can get all the calcium you need from the foods that you eat, and Dr. Van Roma will show you how to balance calcium so instead of front loading calcium a day, what you will do is that you will balance your calcium loss with your calcium intake in terms of your diet and your lifestyle. Now, Dr. Van Roma is a chiropractor, and we all have labels. I'm a doctor, I'm a medical doctor, she's a chiropractor. But what she is more importantly is that she's a person who really understands a human being. She understands nutrition, she helped her daughters, and she's helped thousands of individuals in terms of their weight, exercise, nutrition. And she's helped millions of people from her webinars and from her wonderful website in terms of osteoporosis. She's a champion of nutrition and lifestyle. You see, I have all the drugs. And so I've always been pigeon on that part of medicine. And they are important. There's always a time and place for my drugs. But at the end of the day, the foundational therapy of osteoporosis, the foundational therapy of our health is what we do every single day. And you can change today. Osteoporosis is bone health. It is a lifestyle, a lifestyle change based on nutrition and healthy lifestyle and choices that we make today and tomorrow. So she's going to tell us for the bone chilling truth of how you can prevent osteoporosis and maintain your skeleton. So Dr. Leslie Van Romer is now going to come and talk to you and empower you to better health.